hey Frank, sorry for keeping you waiting there, but it's a, a very a very tense time in the world of MMA. A lot of people have a lot to get off their chest. I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, no man, thanks. Um, so uh, debut on Saturday. You have not fought in two years. You're fighting Fedor. Not only you know Fedor, but you're you're fighting for the first time ever on um, you know on uh, on a Bellator card. This is a big deal, and and you've been doing this for like 20 years now. Does it almost feel like you're a rookie again? Like this is your debut all over again? Do you have those same kind of nerves and feelings? Um, no, I think that when you first start out as a, a new fighter, you're so anxious to want to prove what you're able to do. Um, so there's a lot of pressure in that aspect. Whereas, you know, I've had highs and lows. So as far as, you know, proving that I'm worthy of actually stepping into the, uh, uh, the area to have combat with another top level fighter, I don't feel that pressure, but the pressure of always wanting to perform well is always on there. I mean, as fighters, we know what we're capable of doing. And the, the one thing that's worse than losing is not performing to what you know you're able to do. You know, there's nothing like, there's nothing worse than walking back going, oh man, that's not me. That What an awful day. Cause you know, we have good days and bad days and just you hope that the luck of the draw is that you have a good day on the night you perform and you can keep your bad days in the gym. Do you recall, you know, how long ago you first thought, man, I would love to fight Fyodor Emelianenko. Like how, how far back does this date? Well, I think the first time when I saw him fight Noguera, um, I, I had already heard of him after he'd fought Heath Herring because Heath and I trained together and stuff. And, uh, at the time, but, uh, but it wasn't until I saw the Noguera fight where I saw him able to use his ground and pound really to nullify at the time. Noguera had the best guard in the heavyweight division. Um, uh, and I was very impressed with that. You know, you're watching Noguera at the time, you know, he's arm barring, you know, Mark Coleman, who they thought was, you know, I remember leading up to that fight, people's telling me that, oh, it's impossible. Coleman's too big, too strong. Pro wrestler, you know, uh, you know uh, high level amateur wrestler, there's no way he can be submitted from the guard. And so, you know, uh, Jiu Jitsu prevailed that day. And then, uh, watching Fedor able to take out Noguera within his guard from ground and pound, um, you know, and, and beat him on a decision that way. It made me want to go ahead there. And then, you know, when you see something like that as a fighter, the part of you goes, ah, I want to try. I want to see what I can do. I have to say it is kind of surreal to see you, you know, like to talk to you right now and you're wearing a Bellator shirt, like, cause, cause you are the UFC. Like, I feel like there's a few guys, you know, like you, Chuck, Randy, like you guys are just synonymous with the UFC, especially when the UFC became the UFC, if you get what I'm saying. What is it like for you? Like, do you ever look mm -hmm. down and say, I can't believe I'm actually wearing this? You know, had it still been owned by the Fatitas, I don't think I could have ever made the move. Let's just be honest. I'm very, you know, uh, Frank and Lorenzo were always very uh, uh, good to me. Uh, and so more of a friendship even outside of, you know, and the fact Joe Silva was a very close friend of mine for many, many, many years. And, and, you know, he was the matchmaker. Uh, the fact that they're no longer part of the company, they let Joe go, you know, obviously Frank and Lorenzo no longer have any stakes in it. Um, it made it a whole different company. So it wasn't like I really left the UFC. It's almost like the UFC changed hands. And then I just left with it. What was the goodbye like? Like, did you did you ever have that conversation with Dana? Did you ever say goodbye? Thank you. None of that. You've not talked to him since. Come on. No. 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 Text yeah, message. Speak to Dana. Text message. Nope. What? We've communicated through third person when I complained that no one was getting a hold of me, and then I, he told him, "Well, I've texted him back, or I called him back, or no, he, or, or no. What did he say? He's never called me." And I called again. <laughs> and so at that point, I just gave up. I'm like, all right, obviously, you know. It's just, uh, it's not meant to be whatever. That doesn't bother you. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. A little bit, you know, uh, obviously, but, uh, you know, like I think I said before, you'd ask me that, you know, does it bother me during the you know, deal yeah. with the suspension that no one was getting a hold of me? Yeah, it bugs you. But then, you know, real quick, it's kind of like dating a girl, right? You know, you sit there and you expect to be treated a certain way. And all of a sudden she goes left. You think, right? Like, oh, I thought we were serious. And you're not, you just reevaluate the relationship. You're like, all right, well, I thought we were this and I guess we're not, you know, I'm not going <laughs> to, you know. I just got to realize that, you know, I thought one way and I was wrong and, and I'm upset because I was wrong, not because the reality of it is different. It is what it is. It's just that my perception was was off. So I had a perception that I was a part of the company and very close and that it was outside of just being someone who's contracted as a fighter. And uh, I was wrong.
<laughs> what do you make of, of Fyodor at this point in his career? You know, he, he was knocked out pretty brutally in his last fight against Matt Mitrione. He hasn't fought since June. Um, you know, I thought it was interesting. Uh, I don't know if you watched the countdown videos, but but he, he mentioned that he thinks that you have a lot of holes in your game, which is a, a, a sort of critique that you don't necessarily hear from Fedor when he speaks about his opponent. So I thought that that was interesting. What do you make of him at this juncture? Because he has been tagged pretty badly in his, in his last few fights. Well, I think Fedor is still good at what he what brought him all those championships. The difference is, is that, one, we're fighting in a cage, and uh, he hasn't fared well in a cage. And uh, trust me, I was watching the countdown video, seeing if there's any walls or anything that he's training up against, and I still think it's going to be a weakness of his that he doesn't know how to fight off of the wall. Uh, oh. You know, I think now his record in a cage is two and four, if, uh, you know. Wow. Uh, and so uh, he, the problem is is he is the true definition of sometimes success will test you. And he, let's face it, I mean, he was undefeated for his first, you know, 30 fights. I mean, not counting the, the cut stoppage by TK. Uh, and so I think that it's hard for him to empty his cup and try to learn new skill set. I mean, you know, there's a lot of great things you can say about Fedor, but his game evolved He's add to his game. That's not sentences you can really use to describe Fedor. He still fights exactly the same. Uh, he tried to make an adjustment, and he and I get it. He aimed wrong. He thought that well, because of the cage, maybe these guys are so big and strong. Like I mean, he struggled with Brett Rogers uh, against the cage, and so he thought, well, maybe I, I need to cut down to 205. And then he gets knocked out by Dan Henderson, and, and, and he and I've made that mistake too. You think, well, I'm having a problem with guys against the cage. I need to get bigger. He thought, I need to fight smaller guys. And uh, that's not the issue. It's a technique thing. Uh, his cage technique is not very good. Uh, his ability to use the cage to get up, his ability to use the cage to pin people, to use for takedowns, to use for striking. Uh, he's fought for too many years. And his background is Sambo. It's an open mat. There's no wall. And there's really uh, not really a uh, an issue with going backwards in Sambo. We're like a lot of the wrestlers. I know a wrestling mat doesn't occur with a wall or a cage behind you. But there's stalling for taking one step backwards. So those guys, you know, Daniel Cormier doesn't know how to move backwards. I mean, as far as he's used to driving forward, being aggressive. So you put a cage behind him, it just adds to his style. Um, whereas Fedor, the cage really hurts his style of fighting. If you watch him, I mean, unless he's made drastic improvements since his last time in the cage, he does a lot of things that even amateur fighters know not to do. Wow, that is fascinating insight. See, this is why you're one of the best analysts in the game. I've not heard one person bring that up uh, as 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 a theory as to why he has struggled so much in these fights, the no, common denominator being the cage. cage. Interesting. Wow. It's a huge denominator. Well, even my style, I would do better in a boxing ring because in a boxing ring, you can't shove someone's head against the uh, ropes, right? If I take yeah. someone down, let's say I'm in a fight with you know Daniel and he takes me down, you know, great – ground position, top position. In a cage, you pins your head against it. We all know, well, you've eliminated the rotation of the hips within the guard. There's no sweeps. There's only really a stand-up and a hold-on. It's very hard to submit someone against a cage. We don't see a lot of arm bars, triangles, and maplatas because it limits the one thing that a jiu-jitsu specialist needs, which is movement from the bottom. So now as a wrestler, I jam my opponent's head against the cage or the top guy, and I've shut down a black belt's guard who might rip my arm off out in the middle of the uh, cage now against the cage wall he doesn't and so uh you have to make that adjustment with a boxing ring you put my head against the boxing ring well now i can still flip for arm bars rotate side to side for your feet ankles shoulders i'm still a dangerous weapon you shove my head against the cage it adds it takes away from my style and fedor is very good off his back as far as there's a pivot on the arm and you get shoved against the cage it changes things and you have to know how to make those adjustments I don't think I'm, I'm breaking news to you here, but when you guys squared off for the first time a couple of months ago, a lot of comments were about how you looked. You, you looked bigger than normal. Could you tell us how much you weighed <laughs> in those photos? And could you tell, them, tell us how much you expect to weigh on Friday? Well, yeah, in those photos, I think uh, I started my diet. So I don't know. I, that was January 20th. So I don't know how much I still weighed then. But uh, or January 18th, whatever the date of the fight was yeah. that week. Uh, but uh, I weighed when I started out my with my nutritionist Aaron, and and uh, uh, doing portion control, making all my meals. I was three oh four. Okay. And and right now I'm waking up between two fifty eight and two sixty two, just depending on 
you know, you fluctuate. Yeah. 304, is that the biggest you've been in, in the midst of your career? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, it was funny. I it just, it was about two weeks ago. I was in the kitchen and I had no shirt on. I was making myself some coffee. My, my daughter, my 14 year old Isabella, she was looking at me and she's all, dad, you finally look normal again. Could you please not go back to that? Like, you know, my wife was teasing me. That was when I finally realized I got to start the diet it was in the end of January, December. I was sitting there and she was driving the car and I was in the passenger seat and I was playing uh, Clash of Clans on my phone. And I was balancing my phone on my stomach. Oh my God. <laughs> and she looked over at me and she goes, dude, that is so not sexy. You look like a Cuban Santa Claus right now. Like, let's get this together. You know, whether you ever fight again or not, she goes, I'm not living with a guy that's 300 pounds. <laughs> so that, that, maybe that was just a product of being out for two years and, uh, you know, not really having a lot of motivation to, to go out and train and, and just sort of living it up in the kitchen. Well, and that, and also too, my travel schedule was just crazy. So, you know, I could have made it better. I mean, I traveled since I started dieting and I did well, but you know, not fighting. I was gone every weekend doing seminars or commentary for the ACB, uh, you know, traveling with the podcast with Richard, you know, trying to do stuff with Fumba fighting. And so uh, there was very few weekends I'm home. You're living on the road. I think anybody who travels for a living could tell you it's not the easiest. If you're already not motivated to begin with to eat properly and then you, you know, you, you, you compile, uh, uh, compile the, the fact that, well, now you're living at an airport or in a hotel room, you know, it, it makes it even worse. Let me ask you about the current state of Bellator. And I feel like this is one of the most important uh, fight nights of their recent history, especially the Scott Coker era. Um, because of the ratings for their last event um, were, were, were not good, and I'm, I'm, I'm putting it mildly, do you feel pressure to score a big rating on Saturday to prove that, you know, everything they've done for you and this, this, this tournament, you know, it's all going to work? It, like that was just sort of an anomaly, and that's not the state of Bellator right now? Well, yeah, uh, definitely. I want to show that, you know, that, that my name still draws. And, and luckily it was about four weeks ago, uh, I was talking to CJ, the PR person for Bellator. And he was like, Hey man, tickets are moving way better than we even expected the opening, uh, you know, opening up. So that made me happy knowing that the part that stressed me out the most was that like, all right, I just got to get Fedor out of the picture. And then me and Chael will sell a card. You know what I mean? Like, there we go there. Now I get to work with somebody that understands it. Like, yes, this is a business. We, we're going to fight each other. Absolutely. And even when, you know, after Fader, when I go fight Chael, once they close the cage, both of us are trying to take each other out. We both want to win the championship. Neither one of us want to lose. I'm looking to put him out. He's looking to, you know, to, you know, to smother me against the cage and wrestle me to death. Um, we're both looking to win, but you have to work with each other as far as, you know, to drum up interest. And that's one thing that's been kind of frustrating that, I probably never would have had a bad thing ever to say about Fedor before this. I always thought he was a great, you know, I think guys just kind of quiet, but dealing with him trying to help sell the card, it's like, he doesn't, you know, it's, he kind of has the mindset like, yeah, you know, I get paid to fight. I get to show up and I fight I'm all. That's not why you get paid. <laughs> that's only a small fraction. You could be the greatest fighter in the world. If five people show up to watch you fight, your career is over with. No one's going to, you know, you, you basically then just go do amateur fights because this is part of being a professional. And each guy has to find his own niche. I'm not saying all of us have to be Chael's or Conor McGregor's, you know, they're, you know, but you have to make it to where people are interested in you. And on the flip side that I wish that he would understand is that somebody inspired him. And if that person hadn't wrote, written books or hadn't done interviews, how would he have modeled his life off of those examples? And that's something that always I, I think of is that whether you use me for an example of what to do or an example of what not to do, by me doing interviews, by me talking, me being vocal, by me having the podcast, by me doing color commentary, whatever the case might be, exposing myself, me coming on the show right now and talking to you, answering questions at times I might not want to answer, um, you know, it still is a tool for the next generation of martial artists and young men and women. And, you know, I have an obligation just like them. I took from martial arts. I've learned from Dan and Asado's interviews, watching Bruce Lee movies, you know, you know, so how could you be so selfish to take from the world of martial arts and not give back? Hmm. Fascinating stuff, Frank. It's great to see you back. It's great to see you, uh, you know, have a fight week. And I know this is a big one, not only for you, but for the company as well. I'm really looking forward to it. April 28th, 
in uh, just outside of Chicago, Frank Mir versus Fyodor, a fight that is literally a decade plus in the making. I wish you the best, Frank. Looking forward to it. Thank you for coming on. Oh, no problem, Ariel. Thank you, man.